Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really delighted to be able to participate in this conference. In fact, I'm honored. This is an important conference on an important subject. And uh, besides, I, <laughs> I'd like to be in the Netherlands with you. I uh, haven't been there for a long time, but uh, I hope to meet uh, you at a future conference in this series. This talk is about low energy nuclear reactions. It started out being called cold fusion and sometimes still goes by that name, but uh, we'll use LENR in this uh, presentation. If you look at the first graphic, you'll see that the sub subjects, the subtitles are science, engineering, business, and education. You can also see that I have uh, two uh, jobs. One is a research professor at a university in Washington, D.C., and the other is the uh, founder of a small company that I'll talk to you a little bit more about later. The second graphic relates to the four parts of this talk and how they fit relative to each other. The science, of course, aims at producing understanding. Engineering is all about building things, and business, naturally, is about making money. Knowledge and opportunities flow from science to engineering, and engineering produces prototypes and products for business. And feeding back from business is money and motivation to the engineering community. And the engineers make the tools and the processes that are the fundamental basis of science, of course. So this is a, an engine, if you will, that cycles to produce uh, things for the good of mankind. Underlying all of it, science, engineering, and business is education, of course. You can't function at high levels in any of these three areas without having a, um, an adequate education. So the four parts of this talk, science, uh, engineering, business, and education, are going to be treated in different uh, levels. There's going to be a lot about science and a lot about the business and much less about the uh, engineering and the education. But I hope when you uh, get done with this presentation that you'll have a feeling for the topic and where it stands right now and how these various phases fit together. At the very ending, I'll show you three graphics that have to do with the... Um, a larger energy picture into which LENR is embedded. So let's start with the science. We can parse it into two categories, experiment and theory. And experimentally, there is a really large and sound laboratory database which proves it is possible, amazingly, unexpectedly, to produce nuclear reactions using chemical energies. Hence, very large energy gains are possible in principle, and we'll get to that soon. Uh, they're uh, stupendous if we could uh, achieve most of what may be theoretically available. There currently remain problems with reproducibility and controllability. We have improvement in both areas, but it's slow, and it uh, has to uh, come a lot further, a lot faster, if uh, mark the products are going to be appear on the market soon. Now, turning from the uh, laboratory to the understanding to the theory, there are a few dozen theories on the mechanisms active in LENR, but none of them has been widely accepted. It's a very complex and contentious topic, and I'll show you one graphic on it later. It does uh, inadequate uh, service to the large topic on which a lot of effort is being spent, but nevertheless, it's the best I can do in the time that we have here. I must say that the field of LENR remains outside of normal science regarding both its reputation and its funding. This is a residue of the lousy reputation that it got when it started uh, 23 years ago. And it is a problem, but progress continues and there's reason for some optimism. Okay, turning to the um, next graphic, we're uh, attempting to relate chemical and nuclear reactions to each other. I expect chemical reactions are more familiar to most of you than our nuclear reactions, so that by making this comparison, maybe you'll have a better appreciation of... Um, of uh, nuclear reactions. On the top is a, a cartoon that shows that when reactants and initiation energies are brought together under the proper conditions, you get products and um, energy release. So if you look in the lower uh, left-hand corner, you'll see uh, energy vertically and then the reactants and the products uh, located at the appropriate energy scales. Now the interesting thing is that between the reactants and the products, there is a barrier it requires an initiation energy to get over. And we can be very thankful for this. Imagine that if the barrier to chemical reactions did not exist, we would have burned up a long time ago. We wear flammable clothing in a sea of oxygen. Okay, so that barrier, easily overcome by a match, is what prevents runaway chemical reactions. Well, similarly, there's a so-called Coulomb barrier, the uh, repulsion of two ions as they approach each other, electrostatic repulsion, 
that keeps nuclear reactions from running wild. So the game is to provide an initiation energy in order to get an energy release. You know, you got to spend energy to make energy. And the energy scales for chemical are in the order of one electron volt, the energy that an electron gets in moving from, uh, say, one terminal of a battery through a load back to the other terminal, roughly. Now, nuclear energies are on a scale a million times larger. So what astounded people when the possibility first came up of initiating nuclear reactions with chemical energies is that you could get the big payoff with a relatively small investment. So I'd like you to note that the ratio of the nuclear energy to the chemical energy scale is a million. So if you could get a nuclear reaction by spending the energy for one chemical reaction, you could theoretically, conceptually, have a gain as high as a million. You'll see that we're far from that now, but energy gains in excess of 400 have already, already been reported. They're not verified, but they are in the literature and in fact may be um, right in the end. We don't know that yet. Now when people come to LENR, either uh, listening to a lecture or wanting to get involved in it, they're facing thousands of papers, and lots of uh, complexity, so how does one organize a subject? And my recommendation is to organize it by what goes into an experiment and what comes out of an experiment. The idea is to bring together isotopes of hydrogen, either hydrogen itself, protons, or deuterium, deuterons, with a solid. And the ways of doing this are listed down the left on this input-output graphic. You see that the uh, protons or deuterons can originate in the uh, liquid state, in the gaseous state, plasma state, or is in beams. And that there are electrochemical, thermodynamic, and kinetic processes available for bringing them together. Okay, what about the output site? You can get energy. That's what we're here. That's why we're talking. But you can also get nuclear products, fast radiation, and some low energy phenomena such as sound and infrared. So the uh, shading in here indicates the uh, amount of work that has been done in the field in almost a quarter of a century now. <clears throat> and the darker it is, the more work has been done. The initial announcement was electrochemical loading and heat measurements. That's in the upper left-hand corner. And the two stars indicate the uh, aspects of this field that we'll be concentrating on in this talk. Going to the next graphic, the two primary loading methods are electrochemical loading and gas loading. In electrochemical loading, palladium usually, but sometimes also nickel, is made the cathode in an electrochemical cell with an electrolyte based on either light or heavy water, H2O or D2O. With gas loading, it's, sort of, it's the opposite. Usually nickel, but sometimes also palladium, is placed in a pressure chamber with a gas of either hydrogen or deuterium and commonly heated. The photograph in the lower right-hand corner is a... Um, an experiment that was uh, run by Chilani, in fact demonstrated both in Texas and in Korea uh, not so long ago in this year. And uh, inside of it is a wire, a nickel-based wire uh, in an atmosphere of hydrogen and uh, Chilani gets 18 watts of excess power out of running this experiment. Now looking at the top right-hand corner, you'll see a cartoon of an electrochemical cell. It's an insulated uh, cell, uh, the insulation is in white sitting in a constant temperature bath, and there's three things inside of the cell. A thermometer, because it's all about measuring heat, which is done by measuring temperature. Then there's a resistive heater on the left, and the actual LENR experiment on the right. So the way the game is played is to keep the LENR experiment off, put a known amount of power in the resistive heater, easily known, measure the temperature rise, and get a calibration curve, and then turn off the heater, run the experiment, and if you see a temperature rise, you know how much power was produced. The next graphic is a depiction of that. The determination of the calibration curve is indicated on the left, power vertically and temperature increase. So with the LENR experiment turned off, the measurements are made at various power levels to get various temperature increases, and the green curve is the calibration curve of the... Uh, cell, the, the uh, electrochemical cell before the experiment is done. Okay, then the calibration's over, we turn off the resistive heater, and then we run the experiment and we see a temperature increase. And then going vertically, that implies some power increase, which we can plot on a graph of time horizontally and power vertically, 
in order to get the thermal energy that's coming out of the uh, LENR reaction in the cell. So the graph on the right shows two things. One is the input electrical power, which we know by the current and the voltage at every time, and then the total power coming out thermally, much greater than the input electrical power. And if you look at the top there, you see energy is in fact the uh, integral of the power over time from zero to the time t of interest. And the um, difference in the areas, that is the area that's labeled excess power minus the area that's uh, labeled um, in red, the input electrical power, is the energy that's produced in the LENR reaction up to that point. Now the energy gain is uh, conceptually very simple. It's the area energy out, that is the uh, white and all area below that, divided by the red area, the energy in. So we're talking about energy gains. I just mentioned that theoretically energy gains as large as a million could be had in LENR experiments, but the products that are coming to market in the near future, hopefully, will have much, much lower energy gains, energy gains around 10, but still very, very interesting values. So now I'll show you the results of three significant experiments, an early one and then two more recent ones. The next graphic is a plot of cell temperature versus time from work done by Fleischmann and Pons and published in a patent application in 1990. You'll see the um, tick marks, that's where they added more electrolyte to make up for the loss due to electrolysis, that is the splitting of the D2O into deuterons and oxygen. So every half day they added some makeup water and there's a little downward tick, a little decrease in the temperature. And one fine day they did that and the temperature jumped up the better part of 20 degrees. Not under their control and not for a known reason. And it continued to increase half day, day, two and a half days, approaching the boiling point. 100 degrees centigrade. And then all of a sudden in another addition it dropped down and resumed the curve that was uh, growing before the uh, anomaly happened. So if you looked at this data in 1990, you could conclude that first of all, temperature is easy to measure. Okay, People as good as Pons and Fleischmann, famous scientists with strong publication records, knew how to measure temperature. So they're either getting this data realistically, or alternatively, they were liars. And there was no reason to believe that they were liars. So that curve is an example of temperature only, not power, not energy measurements, that is very, very significant and widely ignored. Now the next graphic I sh will show you is sort of a crime. It violates every r rule of uh, making uh, good graphics, but it's so important because it shows how the field has advanced over the course of, uh, in this case, almost two decades. 2005, Schwartz and Werner, produce this data horizontally is time over 15 hours and vertically on the left is power in and out and vertically on the right is uh, energy, the integral of power. So look first at the um, experiment being turned on, the control power in and out comes up, runs along, they're nearly the same, the integral is straight lines that go from the lower left to the upper right, um, essentially match each other so at the end of the experiment when it was turned off, the input power and the output power agreed with each other in the control cell, which was in series with the active cell. So there are two cells running simultaneously and the input electrical energy and the output thermal power was being measured in each. Okay, so, so essentially the control says that these people know how to make measurements and they do what they should. They agree with each other if there is no LENR active in the cell. As, as was the case in the control. So let's look at the active experiment now. They call it a diffuser. The input energy is much less than the output energy and the two integrals uh, in uh, red and uh, lighter color, lighter shade of red, diverge so that at the end of the experiment when it was turned off there was a large difference in the energy in and out, which is to say the LENR produced energy. It's indicated by the vertical uh, double arrow on the right. And if that's not enough, afterwards they turned the experiment off, there was what's called HAD, heat, heat after death. It continued to produce energy even though there was no input energy. Sort of like burning, but it turned off after a few hours. So th this uh, field, even though it still has a bad reputa reputation, 
has advanced to a very, very high level, and it's uh, producing very good data in many, many experiments. Okay, one more example. This is from Energetics Technology, formerly an Israeli company. It's now in the U.S. I have time horizontally, uh, many hours, and vertically is the power, okay? And uh, the uh, oval indicates 20 watts. You know, not a, not a watt or so, but 20 watts, a substantial power, something that we're familiar with from light bulbs. And the average power after the uh, power jumped up was 20 watts uh, out for only three quarters of a watt in, or the energy gain, power gain, average power gain, and the energy gain was a factor of 27. Now to put that in context, there is an experiment in the south of France called ITER, I-T-E-R, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. It's taking over two decades and will cost over $20 billion, and its goal is to produce an energy gain of 10, where LENR has already shown energy gains substantially uh, larger than that. But this is not recognized. The hot fusion continues to get funded. The so-called cold fusion is wanting for funding very, very uh, uh, severely. So an experimental summary is shown on the uh, next graphic listed on the right are a dozen different measures of why we in the field think that nuclear reactions are occurring. We assert that each of these types of results individually indicates the occurrence of nuclear reactions in diverse experiments at modest temperatures. I'd love to talk to each one of these, but there's not time to do that. Well, what if only three of them are right? and all the others have problems. We're getting, historically, very high energy releases for very low energy investments. So the database is robust and the observed effects must be at least partially caused by nuclear reactions. Okay, okay, what about theory? You, you can uh, say, I, I here are all these experiments, they look good and so forth, what about understanding? Well, the next graphic is a, a very simplistic but um, comprehensive view of the theoretical situation. There are about three dozen different theories of what's going on in low energy nuclear reaction experiments, various stages of development. Some, some are only ideas, others have been written out in equations, some have been reduced to calculations, there have been very few comparisons with experiments. No theory has quantitatively explained the past, the data that's available, or predicted the future, designed experiments which would test the theory. And it's still very contentious in the field whether there is only one active mechanism in LENR or alternatively there are uh, multiple mechanisms uh, that are active. Okay, so that covers the science. It was a, a load I'm sure to you the listener but it gives you in a relatively small number of graphics a uh, pretty good feeling of what is um, the uh, character of the field. So, uh, enough for science. Let's turn to engineering. Uh, it's an aspect of LENR that can be covered in uh, uh, three view graphs, actually. I can do that. And um, yet you'll get an idea of how the engineering of experiments stacks up against the engineering of uh, commercial prototypes. So this first graphic says that there has been a great deal of sophisticated engineering in the design and operation of experiments. You know, we in the field have not spent all of these years, a total of 23 years, just doing the same simplistic thing over and over again. People thought initially that cold fusion was dramatically simpler than hot fusion. And in some senses, that's right. I mean, the hot fusion experiments are very large, very complex, very expensive. But the cold fusion experiments, the LANR experiments, also require a great deal of uh, sophistication in the laboratory. So take one graphic to look at that, and then I'll turn to the engineering of the prototypes of products that began about three years ago and is getting a lot of attention on the uh, internet now. The short summary is that the engineering to date has been rather rudimentary, and that could change significantly in the next couple of years when modern tools for the design and simulation of engineering systems are brought to bear on the design of uh, prototypes and products for alien art. Okay, the next graphic has to do with the engineering of experiments. The images are all from a single website that's listed here. Uh, the ones in the top row are from a particularly skilled experimentalist, uh, Edmund Storms, who works in uh, New Mexico. And they show left to right one of his electrochemical cells, one of his calorimeters, and two of his overall experimental setups. 
you know, this is not amateurish. This is very sophisticated experimentation by a very capable person who's had a long career in science, credentialed, uh, somebody who's worth paying attention to. In the bottom are some other examples. On the lower left is an, an experiment from Professor Don, John Dash's lab at Portland State. In the center is a, an experimental setup from a national lab in Italy. And on the right is a uh, image of an experimental setup from a, a large company in Japan. So what I'd like you to carry away from this graphic is that, hmm, these are reasonably sophisticated, rather well done. Okay, now let's look at the engineering prototypes that have been revealed by a couple of the uh, leading companies in the area, Leonardo Corporation at the top and Defcalion Green Technologies uh, in the bottom. Now, you've probably heard of ECAT, which is short for Energy Catalyzer. It is the name applied to the system that it is making by uh, Andrea Rossi. More on that in a moment. On the top left is a um, photograph of the fist-sized ECAT reactor from uh, uh, over a year ago. And on the right is an image of the entire experimental setup, including the um, ECATs in the uh, aluminum-covered box on the right and a heat exchanger in the center. The images on the bottom are from the Greek company, Defcalion, who's uh, now moving its uh, experimental operation to Canada. On the left is their reactor. Uh, it's a cylindrical object underneath the copper coils that are used for uh, cooling the reactor, carrying away the uh, energy that's produced. The um, center image on the uh, uh, bottom shows that reactor and the uh, water system on the wall for uh, measuring flow rates, temperatures, and the like. And then on the right is the reactor embedded in a, um, a shielded, uh, an insulated box with a hydrogen supply system behind it. Uh, that's it for the engineering side of LENR now. Uh, if you're an engineer, you'll have to be dissatisfied with it. It's a very little and rather superficial, but um, it's the once over lightly, okay? So let's turn to the business sides of LENR now. They are as dynamic and complex as are the scientific aspects of LENR. There is a lot going on now, both in terms of several companies and many, many activities. And what I'll do in the next several view graphs is show you a, uh, an overview of uh, the business aspects of LENR. Since the field began with the Fleischmann Pons announcement in 1989, there have been a few companies that started and some of them have already disappeared. I'll show you those in a couple of graphics. At the moment, largely because of the announcements and activities by Rossi and other in the last a few years, there are at least a couple of dozen companies active in the field. Most are small and new, but some large companies are involved. The two companies I've already mentioned, Leonardo and Defcalion, are seeking to market products soon, maybe as early as next year. Now, some of you know that they wanted to have something on the market already this year and apparently will not reach that goal. But I know enough about them. I've been involved in uh, two tests with Rossi and one test with Defcalion to know that there are very uh, serious efforts and they might bring initial products to market uh, sometime next year. What would they be? They would be few kilowatt thermal generators, which will be small and low cost. They could be used to heat a home, for instance. Interestingly and amazingly, they will produce neither greenhouse gases nor radioactive waste, and that might be revolutionary. Okay. More on that in a little while. I should mention regarding business that the intellectual property situation for LENR is already complex and evolving rapidly. It may take decades to sort out the patent rights part of the field, as it did in the case of light, uh, the laser. And regulatory issues are lurking in the background. They might complicate the commercialization of uh, LENR. So you may ask, why all the fuss? Why is there so much work going on despite little funding scientifically for so long by so many people, hundreds of researchers? Why have companies been set up in the recent past? Well, here is a list of the major potential advantages of LENR. I published it in the, um, at a website that's listed here. And it would be fun to go over each one of these, just as I would like to have gone over every one of the uh, pieces of evidence for the occurrence of LENR. But let me just highlight a few of them that are shown in red here. One is the prospect of high energy gains. I think you understand that already. I've talked about it enough. Cost leverage is another. The nickel in a U.S. five-cent coin, according to some calculations, 
assuming particular nuclear reactions, and my calculations included, shows that you could get the energy equivalent to a barrel of oil out of that five cents worth of nickel. So five cents to a dollar is a factor of 20, and I'll say a barrel of oil costs a hundred dollars. It's closer to 90, I think now, but it, for round numbers. So a factor of 20 times a factor of 100, that's a potential cost leverage of 2,000, which is amazing, okay? Usually if you can reduce the cost of something, uh, some percentage or a factor of two, you will succeed in the marketplace. And here we're talking about just an unprecedented large possible number. To be determined, but at least it looks like it may be possible. Uh, the top two entries on the right say that not only is there no radioactive waste, there's no radioactive material that goes into the experiments, no greenhouse emissions. And then going down the list, there's a very, very important thing, the possibility of distributed power generation. So we could have in our home a unit that would produce hot water and it, they will be made to produce electricity as well. We would not be dependent on the grid, say in electrically heated homes or for uh, cooking and things like that. It would be a remarkable situation and it would have uh, an even more dramatic impact in the third world, the developing world, than it would in the developed world. Very, very uh, large and uh, historic possible impacts. I think you are probably familiar with the um, impact of the cell phone in developing countries. You know, before the cell phone, half the people in the world had never made a phone call and now you don't have to string lines. Cell towers do it and cell phones are used uh, all over the world, even in poor countries. Now, I have to note, there are large challenges to the commercialization. Uh, reproducibility, controllability, I mentioned. When products come in the market, will they be reliable? You turn them on, they work, like your automobile. Will they be durable? Will they last a long time? Will they be safe? And what will the government regulations and public perceptions do to the field? Now, the next graphic shows the companies that uh, were in the U.S. and Canada, where most of the companies were before 2010, a uh, list of the companies where they were and the um, principal people, the ones below the line have already disappeared and uh, some, some of the others are healthy, some of the others are um, essentially moribund. And it was, uh, it's also necessary to note that there was early interest by large companies. Amico had a uh, major research program for a while, General Electric, IBM, looked hard at LENR early in its history. One more bit of history on the next graphic, uh, this is from Italy. Now, Professor Francesco Piantelli from the University of Siena teamed with uh, Professor Focardi from Bologna and they published papers in the early 90s that said there were excess powers of the order of 40 to 50 watts. Later Focardi teamed with uh, Rossi and they put a paper on the web in the March of 2010 that reported energy gains that ranged from a low of 80 to a high of 415. Now I emphasize these have not been verified. Okay, but one has a choice. Either they were determined and published or they lied and put out numbers. Okay, I have no basis, although some people doubt the veracity of Rossi, I personally have no basis to uh, believe that they were lying. Okay, if you get on the web, you'll see there's a great controversy about the um, veracity and the uh, activities of various people, Rossi especially, but, um, you know, that, that, that's out in the public now. Okay, so let me show you a couple of images first from Leonardo and then of Callion. Uh, the um, pictures from Leonardo are shown on the top here. Uh, Rossi produced a megawatt system uh, consisting of 52 units, each of which had three ECATs in them. There's a photograph on the left and an artist's rendition on the right. And it worked at the half almost half megawatt level and presumably was bought by somebody for $2 million, according to postings on the web. On the bottom are artists' conceptions of the kilowatt level units that hope, are hoped for uh, to be available uh, in the next year or so. These are strictly renderings. The actual products that uh, will be sold uh, may be very little like this, but that's the kind of thing that's being uh, uh, conceived of. A few kilowatts levels uh, can be lifted by a couple of people, cost a few thousand dollars, run six months on a ten dollars worth of uh, fuel. Okay, turning from um, Leonardo to its main competitor, Jeff Callion, 
Here are some images on the left from their laboratory. The uh, lower left one is an open experiment covered on the top with the uh, green cover. You have uh, two uh, artists' drawings on the right of uh, units that have nine 5 kW, 5 kilowatt Hyperion units, so a total output of 45 kilowatts. So what's being hoped for is that if not Rossi, Defcalian, if not Defcalian, Rossi, Rossi, or better yet, both, have at least single multi-kilowatt units on the market next year. And there are other companies working in this space to bring LENR generators to uh, market. One of them is Berwan Energy Corporation, where Robert Godus is the uh, spark plug. They have a new contract with the Stanford Research International for thorough testing. The tests that have been done in this field to date are inadequate. None of the tests done by either Leonardo or Defcalion are adequately complete to satisfy those of us who have been working in the area for so long. We've been under duress, attacked from all sides. We have learned how to do things so that we can make a bulletproof case for the production of energy using LENR. So along come these companies, and they're racing, of course, uh, to get to market, but the tests that they have done have not been satisfactory to the minds of most of us who are uh, involved in the field and many people beyond the field. What we would like to see is a test in which all of the energy that goes into and out of, all of the matter that goes into and out of an experiment, from a cold start to a cold stop, is measured with redundant sensors that are calibrated immediately before and immediately after the test run. None of the runs, none of the tests to date have come near that. So SRI will do a thorough test of the uh, Broan Energy uh, uh, equipment, a uh, cartoon on the left showing their boiler and a photo of laboratory apparatus on the right. I must note that Broan is nowhere near as aggressive in promising products as either Leonardo or Defcalion, but uh, maybe they're going to be like the rabbit and the hare and uh, make it to market sooner than the others. We'll see. Now, meanwhile, what about Professor Piantelli? Late in his career, but he says, gee... There are companies, I should form a company, and he did that, Niche Energy, okay, and they uh, have put a lot of data on this website that's listed there, the logo on the left, and their website, the photograph of some of their equipment on the right, and in June of this year, they announced the formation of a subsidiary, so Niche Energy would be the research arm, and the new subsidiary, Metal Energy, would do the commercialization of the products that come out of the work by Piantelli and his colleagues. <clears throat> Now, does that cover everything that's going on business-wise in the field? Not even close. There are other commercial activities, uh, Blacklight Power, uh, Randy Mills in uh, Pennsylvania uh, has uh, reportedly over $50 million of investment. Uh, it's uh, contentious whether or not what he is uh, conceiving of and working towards really is LENR, but it's uh, apparently related to it. We'll see. A company was started recently, uh, Lenuco, by George Miley. And anyway, if you go to the website list here, you'll, you'll find uh, 20 companies, 21 actually, last time I looked, that are active in some aspect of LENR. Large corporations are also active. Mitsubishi Heavy Industries has had an experimental program spanning a decade that has burned several million dollars and gotten wonderful, wonderful results, not on heat so much as on the production of... Uh, Elements, transmutation of one element to another. The Toyota Central R&D Laboratory had two major papers at a recent conference in um, Korea. First-rate work. Shell Oil, 100,000 employees. They have 50 employees that are in what they call the game changers, looking at the broader picture uh, as far as energy is concerned. And they did a, an investigation of uh, LENR uh, in, um, early in this year. Okay, so that covers the uh, business side. If you get a feeling that it's dynamic and complex like the science, then I've done my job. It is very, very interesting. Hard to keep up with, hard to sort out what's real from what isn't real, but uh, it is, um, it, it's interesting, frankly. I mean, I'm a scientist and an engineer. I've had some business experience, and uh, I've been involved in education for a while. Every one of these aspects is uh, dynamic and interesting uh, to me, and I, I hope as well to you. Share the fun. It plays out slowly, but it is uh, fun. So now let's consider the education side of the field. Here's a one-page summary as uh, with the others. This 
If many energy sources come to market as expected, it will be necessary to educate a workforce in their design, manufacture, installation, maintenance, and other functions. Think of the heating, ventilation, air conditioning unit in your home right now. Okay? I mean, it, it takes all of these things in order to keep the air in your home comfortable, and that will be the case for LENR if it becomes a very big industry. It will require knowledgeable managers, engineers, technicians, and sale pe salespeople to produce and maintain the distributed sources. So last year, I set up a company, NuCat Energy, to provide educational and consulting services on LENR, and we offer short courses, and I'm writing a textbook, and those two things will be covered in the next graphic. Commercial short course. We ran the first one in October of last year, a little over a um, year now. We had 30 participants from four countries on three continents, and if you... And, and they were from industry, academia, and government. If you want to uh, learn more about the course, you can go to a website that's listed here. And we plan to rerun the course in the spring of uh, next year, um, shortly before the 18th International Conference on Cold Fusion, which will be held at the University of Missouri in the central part of the U.S. in uh, July of next year. The textbook I'm writing uh, seeks to present a well-ordered and comprehensive uh, set of materials for instructors and students and also to be a reference book. So if somebody reads a paper on LENR, they can go to the book and understand more about the paper by what they find there. It'll have 20 chapters in six sections and I hope to have it out uh, next year. There is, still on education, a growing interest in learning about LENR. The number of websites in the last two years has increased dramatically. There may be 10 or 15 new websites. I don't even count them. They come on and go off but uh, anyway, there's a lot of activity on the web. There's a particularly important website, LENR-CANR, Low Energy Nuclear Reactions, or, if you will, Chemically Assisted Nuclear Reactions, .org. And this graph, which goes from 2002 to the, uh, almost to the present, shows the number of downloads. This is not the number of hits, visits. This is the number of downloads from this website you see, if there are 30,000 downloads a month, that's 1,000 a day, or about 40 an hour. So papers are, on LENR are being downloaded from just one website at a rate on the order of one a minute, okay, from all over the world. More researchers and students are contacting me currently, and I'm planning on offering a graduate course on nuclear power generation, including hot fusion, fission, and also uh, LENR. So that's the big picture as far as LENR goes, science, engineering, business, and education. Let me finish up with three graphics that attempt to set the uh, LENR in the broader context, and I'll use the uh, energy situation in the United States as a, a means of doing that. It's, of course, not the global situation, but it's big enough that it is worth looking at. So we have power sources, energy sources above the line and below the line. The ones above the line are in use, the ones below the line are not yet producing commercial energy. As you know, there are the fossil fuels and nuclear fission. They account for over 90% of the energy production in the United States with alternative energies, uh, solar, wind, tidal, all the others, uh, less than 10%. And the question, of course, is although they're growing fast, to what size will they grow and when? So this is a breakthrough energy conference. What about those that are below the line that may come to be important in the future but are not there yet? Hot fusion is one of them, but it's decades away, okay? Low energy nuclear reactions may be much closer. Zero point energy, antimatter, these are familiar to you. Scientifically sound, but not yet commercialized. And then there are may, many others that are not yet uh, scientifically sound and, uh, you know, that's uh, contentious. Uh, some people think they are where others don't, but whatever. There are other entries here, some of which were uh, the subject of um, talks at this conference. Now, there's a graphic in circulation right now that shows the potential history of energy for mankind and having only three phases. First wood, then oil, and then LENR. Now that's nonsense. I mean, LENR, even if it grows to be very, very big and to have a large fraction, 5%, 10% of the total global energy picture, you know, is not going to displace everything. And in any event, it will take decades because the size of the in industry is so long. So even though things may come to market soon, they may not have a significant fraction, that is, LENR may not have a significant fraction of the overall market until um, decades from now. 
The next graphic is from 2002. It's um, dated, uh, but it's the clearest graphic I can present on the flow of energy into and out of the United States. On the left in green, oil, black coal, and then natural gas is in blue. Nuclear is on the top at red. So you have the input in quads, quadrillion BTUs. And then on the right is, the, uh, is where the energy goes. Useful energy uh, smaller by a lot than the um, energy that's lost due to uh, uh, thermal inefficiencies and uh, poor insulation and other things. You have the uh, four main uses namely residential and commercial, industrial, transportation, and then the uh, others such as the production of chemicals, plastic, and the like. Electric energy is uh, fed by uh, coal, gas, and nuclear, 20% of it nuclear in the U.S., and then the electricity goes to a variety of means. And there's a little line here, a little line goes from electricity down to transportation, and of course, as electric cars become more and more important, the, uh, that line will grow in size. But the point is, that the situation in the U.S. pretty much is still as represented by this graph. And it's a big industry. And you look at this and you see uh, hydro. Hydro's big on some scales. Biomass. And yet they hardly show up. And the same situation will apply to LENR for the near future. So to end up, the last graphic is my bottom line for LENR. The ability to initiate reactions using chemical energies that can give nuclear energies is exciting new science and potential clean energy. LENR may become historic, but first, many challenges, scientific challenges and engineering challenges, business challenges and education challenges have to be overcome. Well, thank you for your attention. I, I hope you enjoyed this story of LENR. I've worked in science, engineering, uh, business and education for over half a century. Could retire if I wanted to, but this is too much fun and too important. I would like to live long enough to see two things. Ellie and I are understood from a scientific viewpoint and have a unit running in my backyard so I can grow tomatoes in the middle of winter. Okay, we'll see if that comes to pass. I appreciate your intention, uh, attention. I'm sorry I couldn't be there, but I look forward to uh, interacting with you on the question and answer period and then hopefully sometime in the future. Thank you very much.